A safe place for unhoused Coloradans is closing. Each must now find a new place to stay. A new study looks at the impact of homeless sweeps like Denver's. These practices actually lead to death. The finalists for mayor say they will continue those forcible sweeps with some disagreements over the details. Colorado's best known election denier avoids jail time for an obstruction charge. And as a prosecutor faces another complaint, we examine what it would take to get an elected DA out of office tonight on Next. Denver is closing one of the last remaining hotels that it rented out to give people on the streets a safe place to stay during the pandemic. The city says most of the 120 people living there have a new place to stay. Some of the others told our Steve Steger they're worried about the future. I've been living here since about uh, a little bit over eight months. Before a loft, John Waldo Paul McClarty lived in a much bigger shelter without walls and privacy. I got some health issues and other deals, and I, I don't particularly like to have, be cramped in there like rats. This downtown hotel was just starting to feel like home. It is a nice place. It was nice to have a little privacy and, and things that work. <laughs> it was um, essential to our city's COVID response. Angie Nelson is with Denver's Department of Housing Stability. The desire to have folks shelter in place or stay at home doesn't work if you don't have a home. <laughs> the Aloft was one of eight hotels the city rented out during the pandemic, a protective action hotel. Just a place that looks more like home. You have some privacy, you have a bit more autonomy, you get to um, choose when and how you turn on and off your light switch and your heat and your air. The Aloft alone cost Denver about $16 million for these three years of operation to rent its 140 rooms. That'll be covered by federal COVID relief dollars, funding that's drying up like the pandemic itself. The overall picture of COVID in our community thankfully has improved from three years ago, right? We have the wide scale availability of vaccines. Everyone will have to be out by the end of the month. The city says they found housing options for most of the residents and they're still working to connect 19 more with resources. We have space available inside for every one of these guests that's leaving the aloft. So whether that's partnering for bridge housing and helping them to find a temporary place to stay, moving them directly into housing. Some folks are moving directly into assisted living or nursing care and others can enter into shelter. We're going to move out, but you know, they keep saying they're going to help us like getting vouchers where it's just a percentage of your income. John says he's one of the 19 unsure about what's next, hoping he can find something like this for his next move. I got a little press going to start getting worried, but I know it'll work out. It'll work out. John and a group of the current residents from the Aloft, they're testifying right now before city council, asking the city for better options and more time to figure out what's next. The city's contract with that hotel actually goes until the end of July, but they'll use May, June, and July to do some restoration work mm -hmm. on that building to try to get it back into the shape of a hotel. You think about people who have been living there full time, not the typical, you know, two, three day turnaround that you'd expect. In a hotel. Sure, there's going to be more wear and tear on rooms. So the city's kind of got to look at this model now see how this works. What do they think? Thanks to the pandemic, they say this needs to be part of the sheltering system. This idea uh, of non-congregate housing where people get more privacy because mm -hmm. it gives people more stability, gives them kind of a leg up. They can start working on kind of getting things together and work towards a more permanent housing. But just trying to keep that in mind, they're actually looking at buying some more buildings where they can do this permanently, where they're not renting from a hotel the whole time. Steve Sager, thank you. Yep. Both finalists for Denver mayor say that they will continue the city's policy of forcibly clearing homeless encampments. New study out today led by a researcher from CU Medical School says that those policies result in more deaths. The study in partnership with the CDC found that homeless policies that include involuntarily displacing people have negative health effects. The study focused on unhoused people who inject drugs and found that involuntary displacement left them in increased risk for overdoses, hospitalizations, and death. Researchers used data from 23 cities, including Denver, to simulate the health outcomes for that population. And the study found that involuntary displacement, often moving people away from the services and community they rely on, could contribute to 15 to 25% of deaths over 10 years. Study was co-authored by Josh Barakas, an infectious disease researcher with CU School of Medicine. Barakas says that Denver, Denver, Denver's health outcomes were among the worst in the study because the city already has limited resources for substance abuse treatment. There isn't nuance. Camping bans, sweeps, 
clearances, whatever you want to call them, they are harmful to people's health. Any policy has to include stopping sweeps and increasing the chances and the access to long-term stable housing. The finalists for Denver mayor have made clear in our debates and interviews that they will not stop the forcible sweeps of Denver's homeless encampments. Let's talk about the differences, though, between mayoral candidates Mike Johnson and Kelly Bruff on their plans on this issue. So both have said that they will enforce Denver's urban camping ban by forcibly sweeping encampments. Bruff has said that she's willing to have people arrested solely for violating the camping ban if they turn down city-provided shelter or treatment. Johnson said he would not use arrests to enforce the camping ban. He wants to clear encampments by moving people to so-called micro-communities or safe outdoor spaces instead. Bruff and Johnson were the two best-funded candidates in the 17-person mayoral race. Tonight's next question comes from a viewer wondering if they can donate to a mayoral candidate again if they maxed out with a $500 donation in the first round. Man, somebody, somebody likes the mayoral candidates. The limit does not reset. You cannot donate again. If you've donated $500 to a Denver mayoral candidate, you are done for this election. But this is interesting. Taxpayers are going to kick in to both of the campaigns again. The city clerk's office says the fair election fund will give both candidates a funding boost for the runoffs. One time payment that equals 25 percent of their previous fair election fund payouts. For Bruff, the only mayoral candidate to hit the fund's $750,000 cap in the first round, she gets another $187,000 for the runoff. Johnson gets $153,000. If well-known election denier Tina Peters takes the job that she has been offered with the Colorado Republican Party, she's going to need to work remotely because Peters was sentenced today to house arrest on an obstruction charge. She's also awaiting trial for tampering with voting systems. The former Mesa County clerk was sentenced to four months of house arrest, 120 hours of community service within a year, and a $750 fine. Peters was convicted of obstruction for refusing to turn over an iPad that she allegedly used to secretly record a court hearing despite a judge's orders. Peters is also facing felony charges for election tampering in a case that's scheduled to go to trial in October. She maintains she did nothing wrong. A district attorney who presided over a well-known murder case that collapsed in Chafee County is now under investigation herself. A series of complaints against elected DA Linda Stanley have an office with the Colorado Supreme Court looking into allegations of potential misconduct by that prosecutor. Here's Mark Salinger. District Attorney Linda Stanley has been on TV a lot these past couple years. She held a press conference back in 2021 confidently charging the husband of a missing Chafee County woman with her murder. And I wouldn't bring charges unless I was confident. Only to drop those charges a week before the high-profile trial was supposed to start. Now she's the one being investigated. A new 80-page request for investigation was just filed with the Colorado Supreme Court's Office of Attorney Regulation Council for unethical behavior. Back in October, the same office that has the power to discipline attorneys across the state confirmed to us they were already investigating her based on allegations of wrongdoing. Stanley is the elected DA for Chafee, Fremont Park, and Custer counties. It's always worrisome if any particular lawyer has multiple complaints or requests for investigation filed against them. Prosecutors are supposed to put bad people in jail. So what if there are allegations that there's a bad prosecutor? If regulatory counsel thinks it's merited, they will actually file a complaint and seek discipline against the lawyer. Nine News legal expert Most Scott Robinson says the ultimate punishment for a district attorney is disbarment. Voters could in theory try and recall the DA as well. The whole purpose of having disciplinary counsel is to make sure lawyers act ethically. The latest filing against Stanley comes from Iris Eton, the lawyer for Barry Morphew. He's the man Stanley charged with murdering his missing wife outside of Salida. In the past few years, Stanley has been censured publicly by the Attorney Regulation Council for misconduct in a different case. She was also scrutinized for speaking to a true crime podcast about the murder case she was prosecuting. Reached out to Linda Stanley today, but did not hear back. She did reply to me last November when I asked her about the last investigation into her conduct launched by the Attorney Regulation Council. She was most concerned in her reply about how I even knew about it, saying that she did not think that the investigation into her conduct was public because 
No one is assumed to have violated any rules. Well, she's probably going to be PO that you found out about this one, too. Um, what do we get to learn about the insides of this investigation, what they're actually looking at? Yeah, not a whole lot. The Attorney Regulation Council releases close to zero information. When I asked them today, they pretty much said we can either confirm nor deny. So not much information until perhaps we get a report at the end of all this, but who knows when that'll happen. All right, please keep track of it, and uh, you go take that call from the DA that I'm sure is coming. Thank you, Mark. Hey, and I want to thank you for your support last week for Minds Matter Colorado, the nonprofit that prepares bright kids from low-income families in our state for college. They do that through weekly classes for college prep and years of mentoring. The $7,000 you raised are going to help them continue that work. Your Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns have raised more than $10.5 million for Colorado's nonprofits, and a lot of the ideas, the conversations start with your suggestions. If you know of a nonprofit that could use our help anywhere within the four corners of Colorado, please email me at next at 9news.com. The Democrat overseeing Colorado's elections has settled a lawsuit with a conservative group that says that she mismanaged the state's voter rolls. And a state senator known for his efforts to get off of work early gets recognized for that at the state capitol. That's next. Colorado's Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold has settled with a conservative group suing over the state's voter rolls. Since 2020, her office has been in litigation with Judicial Watch. They're a conservative watchdog group that claims that Griswold violated the National Voter Registration Act by not properly maintaining the state's voter rolls. Specifically, they say that the Secretary of State's office was not purging ineligible voters, and that led to artificially inflated voter registration rates. Again, not an accusation that there's election fraud, just that there's people on there that should not have been on there. Griswold's office settled with the group at the end of March. She maintains her office did nothing wrong, but she has agreed to provide Judicial Watch with voter survey data for each year. These voter roll lawsuits are kind of what Judicial Watch does state after state. The Department of Justice is asking a federal appeals court to keep the abortion pill mifeprestone on the market in the U.S. as litigation over that drug plays out nationwide. The DOJ also indicated it may ask the Supreme Court to get involved in this case. A judge in Texas recently took the unprecedented step of suspending the FDA's approval of the pill nationwide and another federal judge ordered the FDA to keep the drug on the market in a number of states. Oh, it was a beautiful Monday. No Monday blues around here. Nothing but blue sky out there. It was just a gorgeous afternoon. Mid to upper 70s across the uh, Front Range, the Eastern Plains, a couple of degrees warmer into the 80s around Burlington and Lamar with 50s and some spots in the 60s up in the high country. Tough to really find any cloud cover across the state. It's been beautiful. This ridge of high pressure is going to continue to roll into Colorado for the next couple of days. That means our temperature is going to be warming up, plus we'll be tracking some pretty gusty winds. High fire danger yet again ramping up for us tomorrow and on Wednesday. We have red flag warnings in place across the eastern side of the state up to Nebraska and Kansas. Wind gusts upwards of 40 miles per hour and then looking ahead toward Wednesday. Pretty much going to be a carbon copy of that. However, the threat will shift a little closer into the Denver metro area. Parts of Douglas and Elbert County looking at winds upwards of 35 to 45 miles per hour. So tomorrow, our current record 80 degrees was last set back in 1982. My forecast high, 84. It's going to be just a scorcher. Almost feeling like summertime rather than spring. Close to 90 degrees in Lamar tomorrow afternoon. 50s and 60s up in the mountains. Then look at that seven-day forecast. Possibly another record breaker on deck for us on Wednesday. 77 with mostly cloudy skies on Thursday as we get ready for another storm system. Okay, it is still spring with those afternoon, evening showers Friday. Maybe even a little bit of a rain snow mix early Saturday. We clear out in the 60s and 70s are back for the tail end of your weekend. I'm alive. I'm well. It's a deep dive into anti-vaccine misinformation, online rumors about a nurse who got the COVID vaccine, then fainted. It's not our work, but I think you should check it out. And despite his best efforts, a state senator still has a month of the legislative session to go. But he got a shout out for trying to get out of there early. That's next. Hey, may I make a recommendation, something I think is worth your time, but was not put together by those, those of us here at Nine News. My message is simple. It is that I am alive. I'm alive. I'm well. What kind of craziness has to happen for somebody to have to come out and say that? Well, it happened to this woman, Tiffany Dover, and that is her fainting while talking to reporters after she got the COVID vaccine. 
This woman is very much alive, contrary to what you might have seen on the internet. Her life story is now a case study in how conspiracy theories that go after everyday people can ruin lives. Anti-vax activists fixated her on her during the pandemic because of that moment when she, she fainted while talking to the press. The conspiracy theory went something like, people like Tiffany Dover are dropping dead within minutes of getting the shot. Dover and her family have now had to fend off years of online rumors that she's dead, that it's actually a body double now raising her children. Recommend that you check out the podcast, Tiffany Dover is Alive. The podcast is the work of NBC News reporter Brandi Zadrozny. She also has a long-form story out today, you might have seen a bit of it on Nightly News tonight, about how an online conspiracy upended this woman's life. It's happened to more people than just her. We have links to both those things on the next Facebook page. The Colorado legislature has passed the 90-day mark for this year's session. That is three-fourths of the way through the 120 days. But if you listen to one loquacious Republican, they should be done with their work by now. Listening to Senator Bob Gardner at the state capitol is something of a pastime because the man can talk and talk. He's noted for his note-free filibuster-style speeches that can go on and on. But Gardner says, you know, they could have their business wrapped up already. Gardner's quest for a shorter legislative session goes back years to 2019 when he tried to land an amendment in the state's budget to shorten the session to 90 days. At the time, Democratic Majority Leader Steve Fenberg joked that Gardner could just take 30 days off if he didn't want to be there. So today at the 90-day mark in the state legislature, his colleagues celebrated Bob Gardner Day. Recognizing the good senator from El Paso's steadfast dedication to working 30 fewer days, in his honor, we declare today Senator Bob Gardner Day. Wow. We could be done today. <laughs> <laughs> the shortest Bob Gardner speech of all time. We're back with a sign that absolutely no one fears getting a ticket for an expired license plate in this state. And your feedback next. It's a sign that all of us who are paying for new license plates in this state are suckers. Because you know how people drive around with the plates forever. Look at this one. This could be one of the worst examples we've ever seen. It came in from Wheat Ridge Police. Officer pulled over a driver with an expired tag that dates back to December of 2020. For all of you who constantly send us photos of expired tags and temp plates, the only surprising thing, honestly, is that somebody got pulled over for it, right? In this case, police said the person driving the car said that they are not the owner, so they're not to blame. Doesn't matter. They still get the ticket. This is a good opportunity to remind you about some of Mark Salinger's reporting on this. There are new penalties that took effect last month for people who drive with expired plates or expired out-of-state plates. Drivers who don't register in time will now be fined $25 a month. That has a cap at $100, so once you hit the cap, drive on, I suppose. Uh, feedback tonight from Scott, who says, skip the tie, check. Uh, keep the scruff. Yep, we got that. And carry on with the great daily reporting. Next is the only program I watch every day. Oh, I appreciate that, Scott. Uh, we do encourage you to watch other programs. This is not a newscast of record. We don't tell you about the stories that you see everywhere else. So we do encourage you to watch or read or listen to other things and then, you know, just consider this to be like dessert or something like that. A viewer said in a conversation had in his home tonight where his wife said, how come Kyle isn't shaving? And he said, well, I don't know. I kind of dig it. And she said, me too. He writes in tonight saying, hey, Kyle, shave. You know how this works. I come back from a couple days off. I wait until management tells me that I have to shave. It usually takes one to three days. We'll see how long we can string this out. Follow along next time.